let's continue with the obstacle problem. So uh, remember that we saw, so the, this is just to, to recall a bit the, the, what we last saw uh, yesterday in the last lecture. So remember that we are considering the obstacle problem and then we have, we, we already saw several properties such that the, the problem is a scale invariant and we can consider blow ups and blow ups are homogeneous. And now we were trying to classify blow ups. Okay, so this is the next step in the in the theory is the classification of blow ups. Okay, and later we, later on we will see that actually once the blow ups are classified and then if you get a blow up that is like this, in which you get something flat, then you have to prove that the free boundary is actually C1 alpha. And then from C1 alpha going to C infinity, and then we will see what happens with singular points. Okay, but so uh, remember we said that there are uh, two types, at least, of, of possible blow-ups. And then uh, this was quite different from, from minimal surfaces or the Bernoulli problem because this happens in every dimension. Uh, every dimension is the same, basically. And we have this 1D solution, which is what we expect at points that are nice, that are regular. Okay, so if the free boundary is nice and then it separates the zero part from the positivity region, then you expect something like that, okay? But we also have uh, paraboloids like this. So any of these uh, paraboloids may appear as blowups. Okay? And then uh, the regular points, you expect this 1D profile, this 1D solution, while at singular points, you expect these paraboloids. And by singular points, I mean things like this. So like a cusp uh, here, or like this other kind of cusp that would be in 3D, say, for example. Okay, so different kinds of paraboloids appear when you consider this, um, this kind of singularities, okay? And now the question, uh, the, well, the, the theorem that we wanted to, to show is this, which is uh, due to Caffarelli. And it says that these are all possible blowups. So nothing else can happen in any dimension, okay? So for all dimensions in, R, in Rn, uh, you have this, complete classification of blow up that says that either you are the 1D profile like this, okay, or you are a quadratic polynomial uh, like this one. Okay, so this is the result that we want to prove and this is the classification of blow ups uh, of Caffarelli. Okay, and for this, remember, we have to use the, the equation for the obstacle problem, which is that solutions are C11 and the Laplacian is one in the positivity region. Okay, so notice that the fact that the solution is C11 across the free boundary, it already is telling you that the gradient is zero on the free boundary. Okay, so you have like zero Dirichlet and zero Neumann conditions on the free boundary in a sense. Okay, plus the equation in the positivity region. Okay, so how do we prove this classification of blowups? Well, uh, so how do we prove this? And then we said that a key observation is convexity. Okay, and this is something particular from the obstacle problem that does not happen for the Bernoulli problem or in many other uh, free boundary problems. But here, it's, this is crucial uh, in order to prove this complete classification of blowups in every dimension. Okay, and then convexity uh, is is a key tool or uh, is a key property of blowups that allows to allows us to classify them. So, and this observation is due to Caffarelli in this paper in '77. And then this is the result that basically any blow up is convex. Okay, and actually you don't even need the homogeneity to prove it, but then the proof is a bit more involved. So actually any global solution is convex. Okay, but here we are looking only at two homogeneous solutions. Okay, and then uh, these are the blow ups that are homogeneous. So any, uh, any blow up, so any homo two homogeneous global solution is convex. Okay, so this is the lemma that we want to to understand why why this is true okay and then the proof so i'll i'll say just the basic idea uh first and then basically the idea is that a second derivative of u of the blow up is harmonic okay so because the the equation for the blow up is that the laplacian is one so if i take a second derivative it will be harmonic in the positivity region and it's homogeneous of degree zero okay so we have a harmonic function that is homogeneous of degree zero Okay, and then formally, even though the second derivative is not continuous, so this is a bit uh, cheating, but not too much. Uh, the second derivative is non-negative 
on the free boundary, okay? Because on the on the free boundary we are at a minimum basically. So on the free boundary the function is zero, and then the function is non-negative always. So basically this is uh, the idea is that this should be true in some sense, okay? That the on the on the free boundary, so on the zero uh, set, on the set where the function is zero, this is non-negative just because we, you are at the minimum. Okay, and then you have a harmonic function uh, such that it's non-negative. It's zero homogeneous, so you can look at it only on the sphere, and then it's uh, non-negative on the boundary. And then by the maximum principle, you should get that that the second derivative is non-negative everywhere. Okay, so this is the rough idea of why this is true. Okay, so. And convexity of blow-ups, so the proof is a bit more involved than this, but, but this is the idea, okay? And then the convexity of blow-ups is what allows us to classify them in all dimensions, okay? So this is a key, a key property. Okay, and so let's see now, how do we classify blow-ups, okay? So let's say that the convexity is already uh, there, okay? So the proof of the convexity is a, is a modification of the one that I presented here, but this is the rough idea. So taking the convexity for granted, now we have, uh, we want to classify blow ups, okay? And then we know that they solve the equation uh, in the positivity region, they are C11 and they are homogeneous and convex. So we have a lot of information. Now let's see how do we classify them, okay? So we take uh, sigma, the cone, where u is positive. Okay, so by homogeneity, sigma is a cone, and then the complement of sigma is uh, also a cone, of course. Uh, and then this is the picture. Okay, so we have a cone in which uh, here the function is zero, here it is positive and solves the equation. Okay, now uh, by convexity, okay, so this cone sigma complement, uh, this cone is convex, okay, because the function is convex and then this is the zero level set. I mean, this is the zero sub level set. Okay, so by convexity of u zero, the, this cone, uh, the, the zero level set is convex. Okay, so this is very important. And then we have two cases. So basically the easy case uh, is that if the cone has empty interior. Okay, so imagine that this cone is really like a, a half line or a line or something like that. I mean, something without, uh, interior, okay? Then uh, if it has empty interior, then by C11 regularity of the solution U, you deduce that basically the Laplacian is one everywhere. Okay, so this is easy to see because by C11 regularity, the Laplacian is a function in L infinity, say, so it cannot have any measure, any singularity on a, say on a hyperplane, okay? And therefore, because this cone because it has empty interior, while well, it has zero measure in particular, then you deduce that this is true everywhere in R. Okay, but then you have that uh, U zero is a global solution uh, to this equation, Laplacian equal one everywhere in R. So then you can just use uh, Liouville theorem. Okay, you get the classification of uh, of global say harmonic functions or even with a one here. And then the function, uh, harmonic functions, well, Laplacian equal one in all of, of Rn, such that they are too homogeneous. Well, the only possible case is this one. Okay, so it has to be zero at the origin, with, uh, too homogeneous and non-negative. Well, then you get these two conditions as well. Okay, so this is basically the easy case in a sense, because this happens when you are really a solution everywhere. Okay, you don't see the context set in a sense. You don't see the, you don't care too much about the free boundary. Okay, so this is the easy case. Now let's do the most interesting case. What if the cone has non-empty interior? So this could be any cone now, as long as it has non-empty interior. And then this is the easy, uh, this is the, the difficult case to discard, right? Because in general, having cones, uh, we, we could not discard them uh, for the Bernoulli problem. But here we have convexity. So this should help a lot. Okay, and then take a uh, vector E as in this picture, such that it goes in the, in, in the direction, minus E goes inside the, the cone, say. Uh, and then by convexity, this derivative, so the derivative of U in this direction uh, is monotone, okay, in the E direction. 
And therefore, because this derivative is zero always inside this cone, because everything is zero inside this, this cone, then you deduce that for any direction of this type, this derivative is not negative in the full space. Okay, so this is a crucial information that comes from convexity, that you can have a direction in which this derivative is not negative. Okay, and now how do we do, how do we use this? Well, now uh, this function, so we have a function w, uh, which is this derivative, and it satisfies that it's harmonic, okay, because you take a derivative to this equation, turns out it's harmonic, it's not negative everywhere, and it's zero on the boundary of the cone. Okay, so now we are in a situation in which you have a positive harmonic function in a cone, but again, we know the homogeneity of this function. It is one homogeneous. Okay, so this is a very strong condition on the cone. So because this cone, so remember we can compare, so we have some uh, uh, inclusion. So if this cone is convex, then in particular is contained on a half space. And for the half space, the solution is one homogeneous. Okay, so this is a similar trick to the one we used in the Bernoulli problem in 3D. But now here we can use it in every dimension. Okay, so by monotonicity of the homogeneity with respect to the cone, because this is contained on a half space and it has the same homogeneity than the half space, well, it must be the half space. Okay, and then once you are a half space, then you really deduce that you are the 1D solution like this. Okay, then it, this is fairly easy. It's really an ODE because you, you have a 1D function and you get uh, everything is reduced to dimension one and you get this 1D solution. Okay. So this is the, the, the complete classification of blow-ups for the, for the obstacle problem, okay? Um, so thanks to this, now we can try to understand better the free boundary, right? So we, can, we will have two types of points in all dimensions. Uh, we can have two types of points uh, in all dimensions. These ones will be the regular points and these ones will be the singular points. And now because they appear in every dimension, we would like to understand them uh, in both cases, okay? Uh, so this is an alternative proof for the case two, but I will, I, and, and it doesn't use homogeneity, but I will skip this. Uh, so let's say this is the, this is the theorem that we proved, okay? So we have now these two conditions that use a non-negative function now we want to, this is the obstacle problem basically, that u is a non-negative function that is C11 and satisfies that the Laplacian is one in the positivity region, okay? And then we know that for any solution to this problem, when we do a blow up, we get one of these two options. Okay, so this is the, the um, where we are now. Okay, so this is the situation we have. And now we want to deduce regularity of the free boundary for u. Okay, so how do we do this? Well, uh, the first observation is that we will have two kinds of points. So if this could happen, because we said these kind of things can happen in every dimension, uh, we expect two kinds of points, the, the regular points and the singular points. And these two kinds of points are separated by the blow up, are, are distinguished by the blow up in a sense. You separate uh, the two cases, and then this would correspond to the regular point, this would correspond to the singular point. This is what we would like to prove somehow, okay? So we will need a dichotomy, okay? And the dichotomy is the following. So this is a, a lemma that is not difficult to prove. And basically it says that if you look at the, uh, at the free boundary, say that the origin is a free boundary point, okay? And say that uh, it's here somewhere or here, Okay, so if the origin is a free boundary point, then you have a, a dichotomy. So either, either this limb soup is positive or it is zero, right? And this is what we will distinguish regular points from singular points, actually. Okay, so if this limb soup is positive, so this is the density of the zero uh, level set. Okay, so if you, you look at the free boundary point mm -hmm. and locally uh, the limit, the limb soup, when R goes to zero of the density of the contact set, of the set U equals zero, the density is positive, okay? Then at least one blow up is of this kind, 
Okay, so and here I'm using this classification. So basically, what you prove is that if this density is positive, then uh, along a subsequence, you do a blow up and you get something in which the zero level set has positive measure. Okay, and then because this one cannot be, it, this cannot happen, if the zero level set has positive measure, it has to be this one. So this is the, the lemma. Okay, so this is really not difficult to show that if before the blow up you had like positive density, then after the blow up you also have positive density. This is the idea. Okay, and therefore, thanks to the classification of blow ups, you get this, this blow up. Okay, and then uh, on the contrary, if the limit so if this loom soup is not positive, then it means that the limit is really zero. And then if the limit is really zero, then all blow ups are of the second kind. All blow ups are of this kind. Okay, so this is a dichotomy that we have for the free boundary. Okay, so this is in a sense the, the, the dichotomy for every free boundary point. This is something one can like check. Uh, basically it's independent of blow ups. It's a characterization of what you expect to be regular and singular points. Okay, so this characterization says if the density is positive, then you get this as a blow up. If the density is zero, then you get this as a blow up. Okay. So, of course, I'm not claiming here that all blow ups are the same and the blow up is unique and so on. So, this is more delicate. We will see this posteriori. Okay, but now we have at least one blow up is of this kind. And here, all blow ups are of this kind. Maybe different sequences give different blow ups. Okay, but all blow ups are of this type. Okay, and so the proof is, as I said, this is a more or less simple exercise. So that at least one blow up will satisfy this. And then this implies uh, that it has to be of this form. And then uh, for the second case, basically is, uh, is the contrary. So it's basically show that all blow ups will have zero density and therefore they have to be of this kind. Okay, so. This allows us to give the definition already of regular point. Okay, so uh, say the origin is a regular point whenever this limb soup, this positive density uh, condition holds. Okay, and then if this does not hold, then we have the other option, and then it is called a singular point. So this is our dichotomy between regular points and singular points. And from now on, I will denote regular and singular points like this. Okay. So now that we have really, uh, uh, we can distinguish between them in a sense, we can start the study of the, of the free boundary. Okay. Uh, so we have the following theorem, which is a combination of the previous uh, results. Basically we have that either the origin is a singular point in the sense that it has zero density. So this is what you expect when you have cusps and so on. So this is the, like belongs to the singular set or at least one blow up is of this kind, is a 1D solution. Okay. And the next step is to prove the following. So assume that A holds, so that one blow up is of this kind, so that the point is non singular, then the free boundary is Lipschitz in a neighborhood. This is the next uh, step in the theory. So we will prove first that the free boundary is Lipschitz, and then we will prove that the free boundary is actually C1 alpha. Okay. So basically, uh, I will sketch the proof, but basically along a subsequence, we will have that the rescalings converge to this. Okay, so up to rotation, I can set E to be EN. Okay, and then this is the, the result that we have, that the rescalings of my function at the origin converge to this 1D profile in the C1 uh, topology, locally uniformly in array. Okay, so in particular, okay, in particular, when I take uh, UR for R large enough, I will see this. I will see a picture in which this is the free boundary point. So this is the origin. And then all the free boundary is trapped between uh, two parallel hyperplanes that are very close to each other. Say. So there, I can make delta as small as I want. All the free boundary will be trapped here. I don't know what happens here, but I know that everything is contained in here. Okay, and then the UR will be zero here and will be positive here, okay? This is simply by uniform convergence, basically. Okay, so simply by uniform convergence, this is the picture we have, okay? So, and then this means that any derivative in this, this kind of directions, so that are close to EN, say, in these directions, 
any derivative of ur is close to the derivative of the blow up which is not negative okay so really i take any derivative uh or in these directions and then for the blow up because the solution is explicit i know these are not negative and really positive here and then moreover so this will be very close to being non-negative okay so basically i will have these two conditions that the, 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 this derivative in the e direction for any direction e like this is almost non negative everywhere in b1 so i can make epsilon as small as i want it it is almost non negative in b1 and it is really positive i mean like with a constant that is uh, uniform say i can make epsilon as small as i want while keeping k uh, this kappa here fixed okay J just simply by making r small enough okay so I have a fixed delta uh, that I can make it small. I have, uh, so I can make delta small, epsilon small, and kappa that is fixed, uh, such that this happens. Okay, it is almost non negative. It is bigger than a constant in this region, and it is harmonic here. Okay, so it is harmonic in the positivity region and vanishes on the boundary. Okay, so I have a, a harmonic function that is almost non-negative and it's really positive away from the boundary uh, and it vanishes on the boundary, it's zero. And then there is a lemma that I will not prove here, but basically there is a lemma that says that these conditions are sufficient to show that this harmonic function is, is actually non-negative in the half ball. Okay, so say that you have this in, actually you need this in V2 and then you deduce this in V1. Okay, so you need to get into a smaller domain, but but this is true for every so there is a fixed R for which this happens. Okay, so this is where we transfer the information from the blow up to the original solution, because now there is a fixed R such that this holds. Okay, and you are is really you it's just a rescaling of you, so if this is true for you are it's true for you in a small ball VR. Okay, and this is true for any E such that is close to en say okay and now i claim that this implies already that the function is Lipschitz, the free boundary is Lipschitz. okay because basically having these derivatives that are not negative imply that the free boundary is Lipschitz. because if this was a free boundary point and then u is monotone in these directions then it will be it has to be zero here just by monotonicity so if it's zero here it was zero before and then you can also see easily that it has to be positive afterwards Okay, so basically, in in a in a full ball, say B one, you have this picture, and then recall that this direction is fixed. So you have really a cone of directions in which the fun the function is zero here below, the function is positive here above. So this implies that the free boundary is Lipschitz. Okay, so this is also a, a nice exercise that you can convince yourself this this is true. Okay, so this is now a general fact about functions. I mean, you don't really use anything else here. Okay, so this implies that the free boundary is Lipschitz in B1 for UR. Okay, so in particular, uh, for the original function U, the free boundary is Lipschitz in BR, okay, because UR is a rescaled version of, of U. Okay, so we have uh, deduced now that the free boundary is Lipschitz. What else can we do? Well, now we have to see uh if we can improve this from Lipschitz to c1 alpha or even from c1 alpha to c infinity right because now uh we have more and more information about these kind of points okay so uh we proved that uh if you are not a singular point then one blow up is of this form and moreover we just saw that the free one that is Lipschitz then okay and then now we want to prove that actually once you are Lipschitz then you are c1 alpha okay so let's see why why this this happens so now the proof is uh, a bit different so remember that we prove not only that the free boundary is Lipschitz but also that these derivatives are non-negative okay so and this this is crucial in order to prove also the, the free boundary c1 alpha so this is very important this is a lot of information okay so now i want to use uh something called the boundary harnack inequality uh so this is this is a classical result for harmonic functions in Lipschitz domains that I want to use. And basically it says that if you have two harmonic functions in a Lipschitz domain, 
that vanish on a part of the boundary. Okay, and one of them is uh, positive, then their quotient is C, uh, C alpha. Okay, so the quotient of harmonic functions, of positive harmonic functions, say it's always C alpha. Okay, and if both of them are positive, then of course you can take the quotient of uh, W1 divided by W2 or the opposite. So in particular, they are comparable. Okay, but I will use this form exactly that if that one of the denominator is positive, then the quotient is C0 alpha. That's it. Okay, and this is called the boundary Harnack for harmonic functions in Lipschitz domains. Okay, so this is a classical result, and, and you have uh, in the last few years there have been uh, some improvements of this in, in which you, you can allow a right hand side. Uh, also, there have been a lot of works on more general operators, what, what about uh, less regular domains, etc. But in this version, which is for harmonic functions in Lipschitz domains, this is a classical result from the 70s. Okay, so I want to use this uh, for my problem, okay, for the obstacle problem. How do I how do you, how do I do it? Okay, well, we apply the boundary Harnack to derivatives of u. Okay, let's say u r, which because I wanted everything rescaled. So these two functions, uh, are deri any derivative of u r and the e n derivative of u r, they are harmonic. They vanish on the boundary on the free boundary, and moreover, this e n derivative is non negative. It's well, it's positive actually in the positivity region. So it's not negative everywhere and positive whenever uh, u is positive, okay? So I can directly apply the boundary Harnack and I get that the quotient is C alpha, okay? But now this should remind, uh, this should remind you a bit about the proof that we did for the Bernoulli problem uh, about the infinity regularity of free boundaries. So we have two derivatives, the quotient of two derivatives is C alpha. Well, what does it mean? Well, the normal vector to the free boundary, to any level set, is given by this. It's gradient divided by models of the gradient, right? So now the, pre the previous estimate, so this quotient of derivatives being C alpha implies that this quotient is C alpha as well. Okay, so, and you can uh, recall the, the proof for the Bernoulli problem in which we wrote this in an appropriate way such that you see clearly that this quotient being C alpha implies that the normal vector is C alpha, okay? And then if the normal vector is C alpha, this means that all level sets of U are really uh, C alpha. So in particular, the free boundary is, uh, sorry, is C1 alpha. So in particular, the free boundary is C1 alpha, okay? So basically, thanks to the boundary Harnack uh, and the fact that we already know that the domain is Lipschitz, we deduce that the quotient of any two derivatives is C alpha. So in particular, the free boundary, the normal vector is C alpha. So in particular, the free boundary is C1 alpha. Okay, so you see that we had some common ideas uh, coming. Well, actually this was first, and then this idea was used in the Bernoulli problem to prove the higher regularity of free boundaries. Okay, so, um, this is the, the proof of the C1 alpha regularity of the free boundary. Okay, so what else uh, do we need to prove? Well, it remains to prove only one thing, which is the C infinity, that actually once you are C1 alpha, then you are C infinity. And the proof, uh, this is a, I, I will present the proof of uh, the Silva and Sabin, that is from six years ago, and it uses uh, a higher order version of the previous proof, basically. Okay, so this is a nice observation that a uh, higher order boundary Harnack yields the infinity regularity of free boundaries. Okay, so uh, we want to prove this that if one blow up is so if the point is not singular, then the free boundary is infinity in a neighborhood of the point. Okay, so uh, we assume that the free boundary, because we already know it's C1 alpha, we only need to prove that if it's CK alpha, then it is actually CK plus one alpha. Okay, because then an iteration, a bootstrap argument gives the infinity. Okay, and we start from k equals one. So let's prove this. Well, uh, for by the same argument as before, it's it's enough to prove that the quotient of two derivatives is CK alpha. Okay, so we assume the domain is CK alpha, 
and I want to prove that two deriv the quotient of two derivatives is CK alpha. Okay, so this is the exact same argument as before. Because then if this quotient is CK alpha, then the normal vector is CK alpha, and then the free boundary is CK plus one alpha. Okay, so this is the kind of bootstrap argument that we do. And then how can we prove that this quotient is CK alpha? Well, these two functions are harmonic. So we need this higher order boundary harmonic. Okay, so now this is a, a boundary harmonic in CK alpha domains. Okay, so for CK alpha domains, the result says the following. If you have two functions that are harmonic uh, and vanish on the boundary, and the one, on, one of them is positive, say, on the, on, on the domain, then the quotient is as regular as the domain for CK alpha domains, and K bigger or equal than one. Okay, so for Lipschitz domains, we only got C0 alpha for a tiny alpha. Now we really get that the regularity of the quotient of harmonic functions is the same as the regularity of the domain. Okay, so this is non-trivial. This is not, and that's not follow from Schauder estimates, uh, but, but this was proved in some years ago by the Silva and Tavi. Okay, the quotient of harmonic functions in CK alpha domains is CK alpha. Okay, and there, basically you apply directly this result to two derivatives of, of U, and then this implies that the quotient is CK alpha. That's it. So this implies that the boundary is CK plus one alpha uh, with the same argument as before, and then we are done. Okay, so uh, using some ideas coming, uh, well, basically these ideas are uh, up to C1 alpha, they are due to Caffarelli and this one to the Silva Sabin. But we proved uh, now that the well, the theorem of Caffarelli basically, which is that if the origin is a free boundary point, then either the free boundary is infinity in a neighborhood, okay, and this can actually be improved to a anal real analytic, but either the free boundary is infinity, infinity in a neighborhood, or zero is a singular point and any blow up is of the form. Uh, of a quadratic polynomial of this kind, okay? And the, the contact set has zero density. Remember that the, the characterization of singular points was with the density of the zero level set there at that point, okay? So this is the theorem that, the, this is the famous theorem that Caffarelli proved in 77 in this paper in Acta Mathematica. And now what we want to see is if we can prove, if we can say something else about singular points. Right, so in general, the picture you should have in mind is that in the obstacle problem, these kind of things can happen. So this, even in 2D, you could have something like that. Okay, so you have uh, nice regular points here in which the free boundary uh, is infinity and it separates the zero region from the positivity region. So these are all regular points here, it's infinity. And it creates a cusp here, uh, another cusp here, and then these are all singular points. Okay, so, this is clearly a singular point. These are also called singular points. And you could even have small cusps here, infinitely many of them. You could have uh, things like that. Okay, so this is the kind of examples that were constructed already in the 70s. So this can happen. Okay, and now, well, the next question uh, would be to understand the singular set. Okay, so the free boundary splits into the regular set, which is open and infinity, and the singular set, which is closed and can appear in every dimension. Okay, and a, a key difference, an important difference uh, from between the obstacle problem and the Bernoulli problem or minimal surfaces is that here, the singular set is not necessarily small. So if you look at the free boundary, this part of the free boundary is a curve. This part of the free boundary looks like one dimensional as well, even though we didn't prove anything. Okay, but the examples show that this can happen. So this is really a curve into D, this is really a curve into D. So the singular set, is not necessarily small. So uh, we would like to prove some theorems about the singular set because here it's very important because it's very large a priori. Okay, so the key question in the obstacle problem is, well, what can we say about the singular set? Okay, uh, because a priori examples show that it's not small. So we should be able to say something about the regularity or about the structure or about the geometry of the singular set. Okay, so this is our next goal, basically. Okay, so 
the, the first result, the first uh, important result concerning the singular set is due to Caffarelli as well uh, from 98, I think. I, I wrote 99 here. Uh, and, and basically it says the following. So if the origin is a singular point, then the blow up is unique. So there is really a quadratic polynomial such that you are converges to this polynomial as R goes to zero along the full sequence. Okay, so the only, I mean, the key point here is to say that this convergence happens along the full sequence, not along a subsequence. Okay, because a priori you could have different subsequences converging to different polynomials, and this would be bad. But Caffarelli says that actually this cannot happen, right? And that uh, you really have convergence along the full sequence to a polynomial, a quadratic polynomial P2. Okay, so in other words, the blow up at the singular point is unique at every singular point. Okay, and it's a quadratic polynomial of this form, which we already knew. So the only point here, and, and this is often very difficult uh, in, in other kinds of problems, is that the, at singular points, the blow up is unique. Okay. Uh, so as I said, that the point here is that the convergence is not along a subsequence, but for the full sequence. Okay, so there cannot be different subsequences with different blowups. So why is this important? So this looks like okay, the blowup is unique, and uh, like who cares? No, I mean, what or what do you deduce from this? Because otherwise, this is not such a important piece of information. But it turns out it is. Okay, so the fact that the blowup is unique tells you a lot about the singular set. Okay, so basically, it tells you that. Uh, because if this converges to this, it's equivalent to saying that u of x is equal to this blow up plus a small error, which is small o of x squared. Okay, you can, this is also easy to see that this convergence is equivalent exactly to this, because this is by definition, basically. So ur is basically uh, u of rx divided by r squared. Okay, so you are really like dividing uh, u by x squared, basically, and taking the limit as x goes to zero. And then what this is saying is that in the limit, you get really this polynomial. Okay. And then because the limit, by definition of limit, this is uh, smaller of one after dividing by x squared. So this is really the same as this. Okay. And why is this important? Well, uh, if say that the polynomial is one, uh, this one, uh, xn squared, okay, which is uh, what will typically happen after a rotation, maybe, then this is saying that uh, the positive, so you will be positive in a region of this kind, okay? So this expansion tells you that because the polynomial is positive, uh, when xn is really positive, and this is a small error, then you will be positive. Okay, so basically, u, the set where u is positive, is contained uh, in a, uh, a function like in a region like this, okay, near the origin for some modulus of continuity. So it's something like this that the free boundary is trapped between two curves like this that are kind of C1 because this is a modulus of continuity for which this happens. Okay, so basically, this is saying. This expansion is equivalent, or, well, implies that the positivity region is uh, contained in, uh, in a region like this. So, in particular, the free boundary is trapped between two curves like this. Okay. So, if a cusp is so, this already this is already telling you that if you have a singular point, is a cusp like this. Okay. So, you have a free boundary that is trapped between two curves that converge to a cusp here. Okay, and this is the only thing that can happen. You don't know still what can happen here inside, but at least you know that this is the picture to have in mind. Okay, and then uh, as we will see, this allows us to show that the singular set is contained in a C1 manifold, because basically this is saying that the singular set is C1 at every point. Okay, so this piece of information is telling us that the singular set is C1 at the origin, and then with a bit more effort, this will tell us that the singular set is C1 like uniformly at uh, every point. And then this implies uh, that the C1, the singular set is contained in a C1 manifold. Okay, so how do we prove 
So this is basically more standard in a sense. So I want to uh, explain the proof of this result of the uniqueness of low ups. And, and this will be done using a new monotonicity formula. Okay, and then the simplest proof was uh, due to Monod in 2003, who found a new monotonicity formula that we call Monod monotonicity formula and says the following. So if the origin is a singular point uh, and Q is any possible blow up, say any T homogeneous polynomial with Laplace and one, then this quantity, okay, this is really measuring the distance in L2 from U to the polynomial, okay, rescaled by the appropriate factor. This is the only factor that works in a sense. Then this function, this quantity is monotone in R. Okay, so this is a new monotonicity formula for singular points in the obstacle problem. Okay, so this is something does not happen, that does not happen in many other problems, that you have really a nice monotonicity formula for singular points. Okay, and so notice that by scaling, as I said, the, the, the power here in the scaling is the only one that makes this true. By scaling, you can rescale this and translate it to UR. Uh, and you get this. So this is a nice and simple quantity. Okay, so it's really the distance from UR to a quadratic polynomial. Okay, and then Monod tells us that this is monotone. Okay, so how do we how do we prove this monotonicity formula? Well, by scaling, it's it's enough to compute the derivative at r equals one. Okay, so this is similar to the the proof of the monotonicity formula due to bias that we did it only for r equals one by, because by scaling you deduce it for every r and then we do it in this formulation because it's better okay it's easier than this one uh so you denote wr the difference between ur and q and this polynomial q that is arbitrary a priori okay and then we compute so basically the derivative of uh of the mono quantity is uh this Okay, so uh, this is by definition of WR. Basically, WR is really, uh, remember, it's rescaled at Rx and divided by R squared. So you really get this. Okay, uh, so it's the two cancels with the one half, and then you get W times the derivative of WR, which is this. And then this is on the boundary. So X times uh, gradient W is the normal derivative because we are on the sphere, on the unit sphere, and then this is twice W squared, okay? And now you integrate uh, by parts, basically, and you put this integral, or use divergent theorem, you put this integral as an integral inside the, the domain, and now you notice that W Laplacian lap W is U minus Q times Laplacian of U minus Q, which is uh, this. Okay, so it's u minus q times the Laplacian of, because the Laplacian of q is one, the Laplacian of u is a characteristic function, so you get minus the characteristic function of the complement of the domain. Okay, so you get this. And then this is, so u is zero on this set, so you get u times this cancels, so you get only with a minus and a minus, which is a plus, you get q times this characteristic function. Okay, so this is W Laplace and W, and this is non negative. So, great. This term uh, is non negative, uh, so we can forget about it because we want to prove that this is non negative. Okay, so this derivative is larger or equal than this. Okay, gradient W square minus twice uh, W square, and then we split this into uh, the U and the Q. Okay, so we, we expand this gradient W and the W square, you get this. And I write it as follows. So I write it like this plus this. So yeah, I, I'm not assuming you have to follow all details. So it's just to see that it's really a computation and I want to see you, uh, I want you to see what do we use basically. Okay, so this is simply a simplification. Uh, I mean, I, I don't use anything and now, uh, what you use is that Q is too homogeneous. Okay, so these two terms, you get W multiplied by two times Q with a minus and W multiplied by the normal derivative of Q on the sphere, which is X dot grad Q. Okay, so this is zero because Q is too homogeneous. Okay, and therefore 
we are left with a uh, few terms that are these two with these two and two times w okay but it turns out that this is exactly so two times w is two times u minus q and then if you remember what is uh vice monotonicity formula i mean what well, what is the vice quantity it was exactly this gradient u square plus two times u minus two times u square so this is twice the vice quantity at one and the same for the q it's greater than u square here there is a minus 2q and here there is a q square so this is the vice quantity applied to q okay but now the vice quantity uh is the same for and is constant for any polynomial of this kind so this is a constant that is the same as any polynomial of this kind so it's the same as for the blow up of u Okay, in particular, is the same as the vice quantity for u at zero. Okay, so this is twice the vice quantity uh, of u at one minus the vice quantity of u at zero, and this is not negative because the vice quantity is monotone. So at, at r equals one is bigger than at r equals zero. So this is not negative. Okay, so this is the crucial part, and you use the vice monotonicity formula. So this is very nice, and, and this took many years uh, before uh, someone found it, and it was due to the mono. And this is, uh, I would say, less in, intuitive in a sense, monotonicity formula, because you really use a lot of a lot of stuff. But it's very nice because it really this monotonicity formula gives you directly and immediately the uniqueness of blowups. Okay, so. Let's prove. So, if you have questions, of course, let me know. I'll, I'll be happy to, to answer. But let me, uh, if not, let me prove now the uniqueness of blow ups here by using uh, mono monotonicity formula. Okay, so uh, recall that this is monotone. Okay, this is what we proved. So, basically, uh, because we know that the origin is a singular point by assumption, then at least one blow up. So at least along a subsequence, we know this, that URK converges to, converges to a certain quadratic polynomial. Okay, we know this along a subsequence only. And then we want to improve this to the full sequence. Okay, but now you take the mono, the mono quantity, okay, for U uh, and P2, this P2, you put it here at the scale RK, Okay, so you write this with Q equals P2, this P2. And then you know that because this converges to this, then, well, this is converging to P2, so this goes to zero. So this clearly goes to zero for RK going to zero, because this is almost by definition. So this goes to zero uniformly even, so in particular in L2 on the sphere. Okay, so this implies this, but this is only along a subsequence. Okay, so you get, because we have it along a subsequence, you have this along a subsequence. But the mono monotonicity formula says that this quantity is monotone in R. So because it's monotone, then the limit exists. And because along a subsequence it's zero, then along the full sequence, it has to be zero. Okay, so basically the fact that the function is monotone tells us that it's enough to check it along a subsequence that it goes to zero that then implies it along the full sequence. So it's really a corollary of the monomonotonicity formula, the uniqueness of blow up, right? Uh, so this implies that the blow up is unique because then there cannot be any other, uh, I mean, the convergence is really along the full sequence. If there was another polynomial such that this would converge to this, it had to be P2 because otherwise this would not converge to zero. So this is the proof of the uniqueness of blow ups. Okay, and then uh, the convergence has to be in C1 because we claimed that it was in C1. Here I only proved uh, in L2, say. Uh, so if, if not, say, if the convergence was not in C1 along a some subsequence, then by Arcelas Coli, you get the contradiction. Uh, it would converge along a subsequence, it would converge to another blow up, and then this would contradict this fact. Okay, so basically, for every singular point, uh, there is one and only one quadratic polynomial who is the, the blow up and is unique. 
and I denote it by P2 of X0. Okay, for every X0, there is only one quadratic polynomial, which is the one. Okay, so uh, the next step to prove the, the, the regularity of the singular set, say, uh, which is a, will be a consequence of this, of the uniqueness of blow ups, is that you need some continuous dependence on blow ups. So this is a bit more technical, maybe, but, but this is necessary. And it says that if U is any solution to the obstacle problem, and for any compact set, there is a modulus of continuity such that this happens. So U is close to the corresponding blow up with a uniform modulus of continuity, okay? That depends only on the compact set, say that if, if this is B one half, say, then the modulus of continuity depends only on the dimension, okay? And then this modulus of continuity says that U is close to P2 uh, in, with a uniform modulus of continuity and the gradients are also close with a uniform modulus of continuity. And moreover, the map that sends the singular point to the blow up is continuous with a uniform modulus of continuity as well. Okay, and then, uh, so recall this is the definition of P2 X0, basically. So U centered at X0, you rescale by Rx and divide by R squared. This converges in C1 norm to P2 X0. So the only point of this theorem is the continuous dependence. Okay, so we use only, I, I will not uh, prove this because this is a bit more technical and it's basically using Monos monotonicity formula plus some compactness. Okay, and you get the, the uniform modulus of continuity, but I will, see, I will show how to get the continuous dependence of blow ups. Okay, so basically you get, you take any singular point and any epsilon and then you take any small enough scale, R0, such that this is less than epsilon halves. Okay, so you know you can do this because of this convergence. Okay, and now by continuity of U, there exists a delta such that if you have points that are close to, uh, so in a small ball of radius delta, centered around X0, then I change, I, I simply fix R0, fix X0, and then for every X1 in a neighborhood, I know that I can change this X0 to X1 because this denominator is fixed, and then these epsilon halves become an epsilon. Okay, so for all X1 in a neighborhood, this is true. Okay, so in particular, I can now use a, a mono monotonicity formula. Okay, and then this yields that because this will be monotone. Okay, so this quantity is monotone. So I'm applying monomonotonicity formula for u centered at x1, but with the polynomial corresponding to x0, to the other polynomial, the polynomial of the other point. But if this was close uh, for r0, it is close for every r less or equal than r0 because this is monotone. So this will be even smaller than epsilon. If this was smaller than epsilon, then for every r, is smaller than epsilon. And in particular, I can take the limit, r go to zero, and then get that the, the, this converges to the blow up at x1, and this was fixed, and it was the blow up at x0. So this difference is smaller than epsilon. So in particular, I have proved that given any epsilon, there exists a delta such that if x1 is close to x0, uh, then the two blow ups are close uh, uh, in with distance epsilon. Okay, so this means that uh, basically this is a modulus of continuity. Uh, this means that the polynomials, so th there is a continuous dependence on the polynomials uh, of the blow ups. Okay, and then with a bit more effort and some compactness, you get that the modulus if you, is uniform. Okay, so basically we know this, this, and this with a modulus of continuity that a priori depends on the point, and then I, this theorem just says that basically that the modules can be taken universal or uniform. Okay, now uh, in the last five minutes, let me say that the continuous dependence of blow ups yields the following. Okay, so uh, the, the fact that the blow ups are uh, unique and continuous in the, in the point, it tells us that the singular set, sigma, is contained in an n minus one dimensional C1 manifold. 
Okay, so this is also due to Caffarelli in 98 and with the new proof of Monod in 2003. And, and the proof is basically standard once we have all the ingredients. Okay, so basically, uh, this is selling, this is saying us, this is telling us that basically with all the previous information we have, we deduce a, a certain structure, a certain regularity of the singular set, which is the one we expected from the pictures we had, right? So this is telling us that the worst thing can happen is this, this picture that we already know it can happen, right? So we have some regular points, then maybe a cusp is created here, then we have some singular points, and then maybe some more regular points here. And this is telling us that the singular set is always contained in a C1 manifold. So you cannot have, uh, I mean, you could have some gaps here, okay? But a priori, uh, well, this is the worst thing can happen. So you cannot have worse than this, okay? So this is the theorem. And uh, the idea is that the blow up gives us the tangent plane because u minus the blow up is a small o of x squared. And say in 2D, this is telling us, as I said before, that the, the free boundary is trapped between these two regions, okay? And then this is true for every singular point, okay? And then because the blow up gives us the tangent plane, so this is already the tangent plane uh, here. Right at this point, and then the continuous dependence of blow ups it's telling is telling us that basically for every singular point we have a tangent plane, and then these tangent planes are continuous. So basically, this uh, tells us that the free boundary or well, the singular set is contained in a C1 manifold. Okay, so I'm not proving this. I'm, I just wanted to give a very heuristic idea. Uh, so. And th this is the idea that the continuity of blow ups implies the C1 regularity. Okay. And C1 is because the model of continuity was uniform. Okay. And this is the C1 manifold that contains all singular points, basically. Okay. So this is, of course, very heuristic. And the actual proof needs to use uh, Whitney extension theorem, but it's not uh, too long. And, and it's somewhat standard. Okay. So once you have the uniqueness of blow ups and continuous dependence, then Whitney extension theorem implies the, the, this regularity for the singular set, okay? So this is the picture. Uh, and, and I think I will stop here because it's, it's, uh, it's time basically. So tomorrow, well, um, Friday in the next lecture, we will see what else we can say about singular points. So up to here, uh, this was the classical, the classical theory basically due to Caffarelli and and mono about regular points and singular points and how to prove the regularity of the uh, of the set of regular points infinity and what can we say about singular points that they are contained in a c1 manifold and now what i want to do in the last lecture will be to show or well, to present some some new results that we obtained uh, last year with uh alessio figali and joachim serra about the singular set okay so we can say we can actually say more about singular points and this will be the content of, of the last lecture.